it in there. And that's a, what they call ohmic drop compensation. You'll have to write this down because you won't get it in the notes. Let's think, let's think of what happens when we have a electrochemical cell and we'll think for a minute that we just have an auxiliary electrode and a, and a working electrode. Remember the resistance of the solution is, is like a resistor in between those two points. So anytime we have a, a current flow between the auxiliary and the working electrode, there's going to be a voltage that's developed between those two points. And that voltage is not the voltage that we want to apply to get the electrochemistry to go. In fact, it's going to always oppose the voltage we've applied. So if we apply one volt, we may get a tenth of a volt of ohmic drop by the current flow through the solution. That causes a distorted waves and all kinds of problems. Now, you can see what happens when we do cyclic voltammograms. Now, if we apply a CV voltage to the system, it might be a triangle wave like so. We would expect to see a current that flows like so. And if that current is small enough and RS is small enough, the voltage that develops across here may be negligible. If this is a few microamps and the RS is a few hundred ohms, it doesn't really matter. We're only going to get a millivolt or less of IR drop. That's usually not something to be concerned about. But if the is enough, we will see some voltage develop. And suppose what happens is that now that current and voltage will drop the voltage across the solution. What we're interested in as a voltage that we're going to be applying is the voltage that's being applied across the double layer. And that's just that region of solution right at the working electrode interface. So all this voltage that we apply at the auxiliary electrode isn't important. What was really important is the voltage that is developed at that interface right here after we've gone through the solution resistance. So what might happen is that our voltage that we've applied as a triangle wave may be, end up looking something like this. Whenever we have a large amount of current flow, we're going to get some of the voltage will be dropped. And so instead of a triangle wave, we'll get a, so maybe something that looks like that. Where these little dips and bumps are the IR drop that we're seeing right at that point. So that at the interface, we're actually applying not a triangle wave, but this weird shaped voltage. Well, that causes some problems because now the, uh, vol the uh, CV wave will not be proper. It won't have the proper scan rate. What is the scan rate of that particular voltage? I have no idea. It's going to change at every point. All our theory is only for a constant scan rate, not for these variable scan rates. So we don't want the IR drop to interfere. Sometimes we can't avoid it. But we can't think of ways to try to compensate for it. Let's think about what suppose instead of if we know that we're going to have some IR drop, what we can do is we can make our voltage that we have start with different than a triangle wave. Suppose we start with a voltage wave that looks like this. where we've added in some extra voltage where we know the peaks on the CV waves are going to be and, and so on. So we can think of this as being equal to a triangle wave that we want to apply plus the voltage that will drop due to, due to ohmic drop or the voltage that's going to be developed due to ohmic drop which, by the way, is going to be exactly in the same shape as our CV current that we're seeing. It has to be, all right? Well, the classical way to do this that's been developed the last 30 years is to use what they call positive feedback cyclic voltammetry. And what they're going to do is automatically generate this extra amount of potential and apply it to the wave and do it in a, in a way that automatically compensates for the, for the uh, IR drop. And I'm going to draw very quickly uh, a thing. And you can actually, you know, probably don't need to get the exact details of part of it because part of it is exactly like we've drawn before in the notes. 
so this part, all that I'm drawing here is all the same. Notice here is our normal potentiostat. And here would be our um, current transducer. Call it a current transducer here because we're transducing, we're changing the form of our signal from a current to a voltage and that's, the word for that is always a transducer. At this point we have our output. But notice that the output current here is going to be similar to the current that we want to, similar to the signal we want to add in. So what we can do is we can take a fraction of that and we can get a fraction of it by taking a variable resistor adding it on. Notice what we're doing here. We're taking some fraction of the output current, we're running it through a resistor which will generate a voltage and so now we have a voltage that's, oh actually we have a voltage here, we have a voltage across the resistor and we're going to vary that voltage by using a resistor to get a variable uh, voltage drop. Some of the voltage will be um, um, so some fraction of the voltage out, in other words. So we might get a haul of the current, all the voltage, or a fraction of a tenth of it, or 20 percent of it, or whatever. And we're going to take that voltage, which is in the shape of this triangle, of the CV, and apply it right to the back to the input. So what we're doing is we're having a positive feedback. We're taking some of the signal, applying it right back to the working electrode input. So as the experiment is going, some of the signal is fed back to the input. And what that'll do is that will make a, a wave like this. We're taking some of the signal, adding it to the starting triangle wave, and that's coming in here, remember. Here was our, here, here is our CV looking uh, voltage. Reference electrode potential is the same. And, uh, and we're adding it in. And so what can, what can happen? Well now what we've done is we've added that little bit of extra current that we need or a little bit of the extra voltage that we need to compensate for the voltage that will drop through the solution resistance. This is what they call a positive feedback compensation of the solution resistance. And what happens in the positive feedback that we talked about? Well if we have a, all of the signal being fed back, we get the same thing we get with a microphone and a speaker. We get a, uh, oscillations and squeals. Uh, in this case, if we try to make the amount of fed back signal too high, you get oscillations in the signal. You can see that if you have one of these devices. If you turn up the uh, fraction of compensated amount, it'll, get os it'll oscillate. So what you want to do is set that resistor to some value that some fraction less than 100 percent, usually 80 or 90 percent. At that point you get some of the signal gets fed back, but not so much that you get positive feedback and, and uh, oscillations. And that eliminates but some of the IR drop, not entirely because I said it can only be 80 or 90 percent, so you get some fraction less than 100 percent. But it is still useful, a useful method of uh, doing that experiment. Um, the, the only, the, there's a couple problems. One is knowing what the exact fraction should be to avoid oscillation. And usually you don't know, you have to, you have to vary the uh, amount of the, on the resistor a little bit until you start to see the beginning of the oscillations. What you'll see is the signal starts to look noisy on the scope. And, um, and you can, or the computer, and you can back it off. The other way is to look at it. If you know exactly what the uncompensated resistance is, the resistance through the solution here, uh, you can actually set that to be 80 or 90 percent of what that solution resistance is. 
And so you can use some other method. Sometimes potential stats have a built-in way of uh, generating that number for you, and they can automatically set the feedback compensation value. So here's a method where positive feedback, which is not normally used, is used with, in electrochemistry to, to eliminate some of the effects of IR drop. There's a couple other methods that people use. One is a method in which you periodically interrupt the amount of current flowing through this, the system. In other words, you put a switch in the auxiliary electrode channel, and you just shut off the auxiliary electrode from time to time. At that point, there will be an, uh, just before you turn it off, there will be an IR drop that flows through the system, or because of the current flowing through the system. As soon as you shut the current off, the IR drop will be zero. And so what you can do is you can detect the difference between turning the, when the current is on and when the current is off, and use that to add a correction voltage to the input. The thing is you have to do that very quickly so that your signal does not look like you see a bunch of pulses of it being turned on and off. So what they do is they'll do it at a few tens or kilohertz or so, and they'll turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off very quickly, so fast that you really don't notice it under normal conditions. If you're doing a sweep at a volt per second, you would notice those currents being turned on and off. And, uh, and that's a, actually a pretty good method of, of um, correcting the IR drop. You notice the problem, though, the faster you actually do the experiment, the faster you'd have to turn it on and off. And that is practically difficult once you get to uh, tens or hundreds of volts per second. And so you wouldn't use it for fast experiments. Slow experiments like corrosion experiments, they use what they call potential interruption IR compensation is a, is a very common and popular way, and it works pretty well. So you have, this is positive feedback compensation, and you also p see uh, current, I guess they call it current interruption uh, IR drop, and both of those are used. And uh, for example, the Solartron instrument allows you to do both types of IR drop compensation. The BAS instrument we've got, VS100 only does positive feedback ohmic drop compensation. Once you, you have to be careful if you os if this starts oscillating, what you can do is you can ruin your electrode and you can ruin your solution. So, um, so sometimes it's more trouble than it's worth. But in many cases where you don't have any choice, you have to somehow get rid of some of the resistance. That's a it's a fine way of doing it. All right. One other thing I want to talk about with electrochemical instrumentation is 